um, I invite uh, Gokul to come on stage to talk us about the future of manufacturing. Uh, Nikhil, co-founder, is also there in the audience, and they have a demo set up right outside. Gokul, over to you. Audio is up? Oh, great. I think Sunil took a few slides away from the presentation that I was supposed to have. So in my hand, I have uh, two objects, right? So both are made of the same material, used for completely two different purposes, though we use it in the same scene often, right? And in your hands, you have a device that holds a couple of apps that are very, very prevalent, right? And they consume an entirely different kind of data. They were built out of an entirely different set of you know, uh, tools and also perform a completely different task from just using a GPS data to kind of you know, call a car where it is, wherever it might be, and to take a picture of a scene and then carve out something beautiful out of it, right? It's what another app does. But when you actually fast forward and look at the place where they were, they were formed or they were created, right? They were built. The machines that built them look entirely different, but the machines that were used to, to do those two information manufacturing seems to be exactly the same, right? So this brings to a question. Why do objects suffer this and not data? Why? And why can't the objects have a very universal platform to manufacture them like you have for the information from wide varieties of data that you have, right? This is not something, I mean, of course, it's software, it's virtual, so it's easy, but that was not the case. 1980s, we have witnessed this. There were so many different devices that were processing information, data, information out of data, wide varieties of data, which became one universal platform. How did this happen? Because we had something called as an ALU, right? Where every connotation of data being converted from data to information was either arithmetic, you add or remove data, and you had a logical sequence around it. That's exactly what a factory does. It's like a factory is like a magical hand that goes to the earth, pulls the raw material out, and then from the raw material, it carves the shape, right? That's all is different between these two materials, both steel, right? Why is that can't be universal? This is where the issue comes in. Here is a PlayStation, and you also see a cacophony of different you know, tools and en hyper-engineered you know, uh, devices that has been put together so that it can do a very simple task of orienting from an horizontal to a vertical position, right? That's all you're doing. And it took more than three years for Panasonic to complete this, right? Why is this so complex? Because every time we see a task to be different, we end up building different machines, right? And what do we do as a task? We have to interface with the shapes of the objects, how I grab them, how I grasp them, right? Move them from a particular position to another position to an expected. Could be taking a food or cleaning this or arranging it somewhere. In all of these cases, moment we see each of the tasks to be different tasks, we end up building different machines. And the moment the object changes its orientation, its shape changes. So we end up building a lot of containers. What you see here is a very sophisticated container that can handle its dimension from this orientation to this orientation, right? So this makes us kind of not comprehend a machine that can be very universal. So here comes the problem for the customer. We all know the transformation. Sunil did this already, but and much better probably an introduction than what I can do. That's how much special is invested typically in knowing what we do and how we do it. And for customer, what McDonald's learned out of Ford in serializing production and bringing consistency, let's say, for taste, for let's say, for McDonald's, Ford hasn't been able to learn that from McDonald's, especially when it comes to franchising their manufacturing. I have a know-how of how to produce a 10,000 components come together and then form a car, but somehow when I have to go to a new market, I'm not able to successfully establish it simply because I'm constrained by uh, having to implement that whole know-how, right? That's a huge problem, right? And why is that happening? If I have a model of a particular car, whether it's one car or a 30,000 car, it costs the same for me to establish that infrastructure. And if I'm not able to produce 30,000 cars, I'm not profitable. But market might say that, hey, I don't have capacity to absorb, or I'm not willing to absorb one model of 30,000 quantity. Three models of 30,000 quantity is acceptable. Only if I'm able to blend multiple models into the same line, then I'm able to kind of franchisee my whole uh, 
know how or how to manufacture this and I could blend this. This universalization is one of the biggest component that is withholding the manufacturing and then enslaving the design to manufacturing. Today you cannot bring utility of what you want to the customer because there is a huge uh, you know, uh, pathway of passage of manufacturing you have to go through before it becomes a value to the customer. Right? That limitation is constraining and you know, uh, contrary to the popular belief, um, automotive manufacturing is the largest buyer of robotic arms and it among the organized sector, the largest employer of blue collar labor, right? Uh, construction, agriculture is not that organized yet, but if you think about automotive, it's one of the largest organized, uh, organized system, right? This is the biggest advantage that they want in terms of standardization. They want the automation to be standardized. That's how we could actually simplify the whole process of having to build an infrastructure to make a robotic arm work, right? So often, of course, the benefits of automation is not to be articulated, uh, all of us would know. But the biggest issue that we have in adopting automation is the variety that comes in. Every time that you have to kind of you know, put too many uh, different tools and instruments and things that you have to engineer and then bring them together. So when we want to automate, we can go two ways. One, you can hyperstructure your environment or you can make your machine more adaptable, the automation, automation machine to be adaptable. Often we always resort to the first, and this is what we have done. We have you know, hyper-engineered the whole environment. This le leads a $200,000 system, an automation system, uh, to be 70% service-oriented, customized, and if I am not able to get the feasibility of 70% of this value stack proven, I cannot buy the 30%. So this is also another reason robotics has been, or robot automation has hasn't actually accelerated to the extent that it should have been. It's a 40-year-old industry, probably 60 years. In 1967 uh, is the first robotic arm that came. At the crux of all this is not the incapability of the robotic arm. It's not the, oh, we don't have enough innovations in the fingers or enough innovations with the robotic arm, right? At the crux of it is actually vision, right? Contrary to the popular belief, how do we kind of understand vision? Hey, the object, if I want dynamism, I need to be able to locate what's changing in the environment. My object is changing in the environment. I don't know where exactly it is. It's somewhere buried in this whole cacophony of colors. Why do I use vision? I take a snapshot of the object, search that in the environment. Wherever it could be, I would allow the system to go and grab them. But only if I could identify the object, I'll be able to act on them. But if I just pull out a keychain from my pocket which you have never seen, or any object from my pocket which I have, which I have never shown to you before, will be able to simply grab it from my hand, start looking at it. You used your eyes, you used your hand, you took it from my hand, and then you started noticing what that object is. Without having to identify or classify what that object is, you were able to act on it. But the way the current vision, machine vision industry works is predominantly from you need to identify to act, you cannot have dynamic acquisitions, you cannot do the way your eyes actually turn, look at things. If I don't have enough information, if there is too much of glare, I can do this. I can, you know, adjust my vision, acquire the things, guide the system. All this heuristic process is not inbuilt into the vision system. Even the hardware stack doesn't have them, right? Only when we do that, then there is, there is something interesting that comes about. We discussed how every task is combination permutation of picking, orienting, and placing. Here is a whole bunch of never seen before objects for the robotic arm. Each one have different hardness, different weight, different shapes, right, and different colors. Yet the system is able to effortlessly pick this. We have one of these setups uh, put there. Um, this Coke can is almost half a kg in weight. If you applied the force that you applied for the Coke can, the tube would have squeezed out all the contents that are there inside, right? Yet the system heuristically understands how much force to apply on an object that has never seen before, right? The second problem that we had is the mirror finish and the cacophony of colors that actually comes, right? No object is void of reflections, and we call this a litmus paper test for AI. And because of this, typically, the systems that we have today struggles a lot to be able to successfully perform. We see a lot of videos of systems picking, touching, and dropping, but we don't see them you know, putting apart, mating apart, or dynamically adjusting and adapting and picking them, right? 
So the first thing the robotic system should have is an inherent capability like a human being to kind of adapt to all the variations that is happening without having any prior knowledge of the object. This is what actually comes about if you unleash the robot from that white tray, right? The robot just becomes as curious as a baby, like a baby pulls your hair, tries to grab whatever that you show in front of them. The system kind of tries to pick whatever that has been given. It's just a normal lighting in the regular setup. There is a person can change, the backgrounds can change. It, back to back, it's able to pick even very soft objects, including even this wafer packet chip, right? The first part was half a kg in weight. If you applied that force on top of this, it would have just burst open the whole thing, right? This is the foundational capability that a system must have so that you can standardize. Now, previously we saw that every shape, every orientation, and even for a flip, you are supposed to make a customized machine. Here you have one system that can handle wide varieties of different objects, right? When this happens, something beautiful actually uh, comes about. Every task that we typically have is a combination of picking, orienting, and placing. Let's say you pick a pen, and then you write. That's a combination, continuous combination of picking, orienting, and placing. Or you pick a spoon, and then you eat. That's again a continuous combination of picking, orienting, and placing. Or you clean the spoon. That's a continuous combination, permutation of picking, orienting, and placing. When you generalize this, this is what actually comes about. The future of factories are not going to be large, monolithic, uh, com complex setups, massive setups that you'd have. They'll be micro and more capable, just like a human being. In fact, human beings are nothing but walking universal factories. That's the only other alternative that you have who can handle so many wide varieties of objects at the same point of time and tasks at the same point of time, the same infrastructure which you used to produce. Except humans are extremely good at adapting to variations, but not tasks. Machines are extremely good at adapting to variations of tasks, but not objects. We are trying to blend them both, right? And this is a view into our lab. We have a 13,000 square feet of space one of the very few R&D labs that can hold and host these many robots and then be able to build this for the customers. So this is based out of Whitefield uh, in Bangalore. So what's more interesting is what comes about after standardization. Let's say the first task, if you, the analogy that we always pick is from the electronics industry or the data industry. Uh, 1980s, you couldn't differentiate processing or a software from hardware. It was always one single system. What isolated and created a $12 trillion software industry today is the capability of a $26 trillion standardized electronics industry, or more than that, your computer industry, right? Very similar to it, we will have a very foundationally universal system. Every object has wide varieties of shapes, but that, the moment you learn to handle each of the objects, you create a neural model of that object. That when combines with the tool model, you can actually build wide varieties of tasks, right? Be it from your cooking. Imagine, you know, you have gone, you have visited Thailand and you liked a particular dish and it was very tasty. If the person, the person who created that restaurant has created because he has a new recipe and that's how he earned a customer. If you want to monetize that, he has to come all the way to India, set up the whole, uh, fa you know, the, the restaurant and also have to gain 100 other customers to come every day to monetize that one customer that he got in Thailand, right? On the other hand, let's say you can pick up your phone, take your Zomato or Swiggy or whichever the app that you might have, order it, all the way from you know Thailand, you get it the next moment. And it's not going to come through very fast air service or so and so, it's going to come through your fiber optic cable, where when you have every house is holding this robotic arms, should be able to, you know, you, you use the same robotic arm to teach your recipe, and the recipe gets uploaded to a system where we call it as an object or a task store, and you could just download it to your system, just like you have laptops in your house, you will have these systems at your house, at your disposal, and immediately you're able to cook your dish, and you're just paying for that one particular you know, uh, recipe, right? One of the primary ancillary things that we, that we think will come about in the later stages is today, the amount of uh, conversational AI's growth and, um, has happened, is more on the noun basis, not on the verbs, right? It may not understand today what it means to, you know, throw a ball or catch a ball and so on and so forth. How do the, we make the machines understand verbs, right? That happens only when they could have felt what it means to catch a tennis ball versus a cricket ball, 
right? And what is the impact of it and so on and so forth. Giving meaning to those verb, of, to those sounds in terms of the physical world impact is what will allow you to bring something called as an object search and can enhance conversational AI at one point of time. And we have other ancillary use cases where we think about driverless cars, AR, and immersive entertainment, right? So this is the bigger and grander vision that we are actually looking at when when universal factories happen, the micro universal factory setups actually happen, the transformation that will bring to the setup that you would have around is what we actually envision in the bigger picture. And this is exactly why you would notice Vishesh taking his liking and probably Speciale coming in, right? So no better than someone else who would actually, you know, uh, be part of this particular journey and has been with us from the first pitch that we made from how we were imagining universal factors. It's very hard for someone to understand the whole transition happening, and also put the trust into a new industry to be built altogether, right? And there is so much of hardship that you have to come about in bringing the whole ecosystem around, creating that ecosystem around, and it, uh, they don't come only from the factor that, hey, I gave you the money and then I'm just expecting the value to just multiply, right? They just look, look at the way Sunil actually introduced us, right? So that's the level to which the integration of special happens within the startups. Right, so that's, I think there's a lot more of role that they play in getting this vision to the truth. So yeah, a lot more credits to them too. So 